Hello and welcome to today's Tech Talk with the Department of Homeland Security, Science and Technology Directorate. Today we're going to be talking about automotive cybersecurity. We've got three folks who are here to join us. Um, I'd like to give you all a chance to introduce yourselves before we get started. Sure. I'm uh, Chase Garwood. I'm with the Department of Homeland Security, Science and Technology Directorate, Homeland Security Advanced Research Projects Agency, Cybersecurity Division. And uh, I'm the Federal Program Manager overseeing a portfolio of research and development projects. Uh, automotive and vehicle uh, cybersecurity, one of those uh, areas. Great. Uh, I'm Brendan Harris. I'm a cybersecurity specialist in the Advanced Vehicle Technologies Division at the uh, U.S. Department of Transportation Volpe National Transportation Systems Center in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And my name is David Balance, and I'm a senior computer scientist with nonprofit research center SRI International, and I'm part of a team that provides technical and programmatic support for the DHS S&T cybersecurity R&D program, and in particular, I support Chase on the cyber physical systems security project. Great. I'm so glad to have you all here today. Um, we're going to kick things off. I'm going to ask a few questions, but type in your questions if you have one, and we'll get to them in a, in a few minutes. So just to set the stage, can you tell us about some of the current issues in cybersecurity for vehicles? What do we need to be concerned about? Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll kick it off uh, for, the, for the group here. Um, basically, cars are not what they were 30, 40 years ago, right? You know, you have your classic cars where you had a Cadillac converter, you had an engine, you put gas in it, you know, a lot of physical engineering uh, in, into that vehicle, mm -hmm. right? Cars today, current models and what we're seeing coming out here very shortly, are computers on wheels, multiple computers on wheels, yeah. complex systems in a vehicle from, uh, you know, your, your fuel management to your infotainment, right, your, your DVD player to yeah. your video player to your, your whatever mobility connections uh, to your airbags to everything in the, in the, call, in the car. So it's, it's very complex and since it is a computer or multiple computers on wheels, just like with our desktops or our mobile phones, uh, our, our home automation, whatever it may be, there are risks, um, there are issues, there are things that can uh, be hacked and whatnot. Uh, mm -hmm. So we need to take uh, very similar cybersecurity uh, approaches uh, to those, those potential risks. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, uh, and building on that, so not only do you have these more, uh, you know, computers controlling more of the physical aspects of the vehicle, you're also seeing at the same time a proliferation of <coughs> communications technologies being added. These come in the form of Wi-Fi hotspots, Bluetooth connectivity to your radio so you can do hands-free communication. You have tire pressure monitoring systems in your car, that, uh, in your tires that monitor the air pressure. So in addition to these, you know, new cyber physical systems in the car is being paired with tremendous connectivity to the outside world, particularly when you look at fleets and uh, fleet management technologies to look at large numbers of vehicles to uh, assist in maintenance and monitoring of vehicles, making sure that uh, things are fixed on time, making sure that things are uh, just taken care of in a, in a reasonable manner, monitoring mm -hmm. your fleet. Yeah, it's my understanding even the seat belt tensioner uh, is computer controlled. Wow, yeah. Yeah. did not know that. Um, so it sounds like, you know, as we are growing more accustomed to having more smart devices, more, you know, um, connected devices in our daily lives. That's happening in cars. That opens it up to the sort of typical cyber risks that we're used to seeing with, you know, make sure that your systems are protected and how they're communicating with each other, that sort of thing. Well, and as, as Brenda said, it's, it's not just from a computer uh, virtual world anymore, right? right? We're, we're concerned about, um, you know, you losing data or somebody mm -hmm. getting access to data or ransomware or those things that we, we're concerned about with regular, you know, computer hygiene on our phones or our laptops or our our PCs now, in a, especially in, a, in an automobile or a vehicle or in, a, in other cyber physical spaces, it's now those computers can have real world effects in real time, yeah. not just a ones and zeros virtual uh, you know, issue anymore. Mm -hmm. So it's not someone shutting down your computer; it's someone shutting down your car and everything that that, that might exactly. entail. Exactly. Gotcha. Um, so that's sort of the environment that we're operating in. What are some of the ways that we can either mitigate or start protecting from cyber attacks? Sure, so one of the um, major aspects of our research several years ago was looking at 
mitigations that exist right now that are either aftermarket or can be built into the supply chain of automobiles. Mm -hmm. Uh, those, there's kind of like four major ones, then most of them are adopted from traditional enterprise IT environments. So these are things like using a firewall to segment and break out different parts of, uh, of your automotive network to separate those high connectivity components from the components which have um, tremendous physical consequences like Chase was talking about. Mm. And we're also seeing um, hardware security modules which can create <coughs> encryption between <coughs> messages so that it's harder to send messages that have Poor, that have detrimental effects. And we're also seeing intrusion detection and prevention systems which can monitor the state of the communications and in the event that there is something that's dubbed anomalous, mm. um, it can intervene and prevent those messages from having their, their intended consequence. So those are kind of some of the major ones. And then what we've seen is that these were, tr these were aftermarket devices that were kind of being you know, hacked into the car you know, between different components and now the tier one suppliers, or the people who manufacture the components of the vehicle, are starting to build these into their offerings and that the OEMs are now integrating more secure architectures uh, in the future. And I want to pull that point out a little bit because it's not sure. patching something anymore, it's really building the security into it. Can right. you talk more about why that's important? You sure, well that's important. So I, I think in a little bit we're going to talk ab about software updates and patching, but mm -hmm. that's really, it's an after the fact kind of thing. and, and in order to really have a robust, secure system, particularly when human life is involved, you really want the architecture to be designed in such a way that it's not going to malfunction, that these risks are accounted for. Um, because a lot of these risks weren't something that were being thought of five or 10 years ago. Yeah. And with the long life cycle of cars on the road, it's important for them to be secure uh, when they come off the assembly line. That's a great point. Yeah. Um, and this notion of designed in security is actually something that's been integral in the cyber physical system security program. Mm -hmm. A lot of these new CPS and Internet of Things or IoT type devices are designed with functionality as their primary concern yeah. and w now is the time to start thinking about security. So as they start to promulgate and proliferate, we'll see uh, them uh, with security as an integral part. We found in, in a lot of areas, uh, especially in the cyber physical system space and I IoT space, that much more cost effective to design in at the front end as, as usual, right? This is you know, not, not anything new to right. the community. Um, so it's much more cost effective, much more efficient, and much more effective to at the engineering design and architectural stage versus kind of a you know typical you know bolt on right, or right. we accept a risk you know later on on you know down the the product life cycle mm -hmm. and, and that's one thing to mention I think uh, is while we're talking about cybersecurity risk and, and you know the cybersecurity aspects you know there's a lot of great things that we're seeing coming out of uh, the automotive technology in the cyber physical uh, space uh, that is going to improve you know you know, safety, yeah. um, efficiencies, uh, you know, a lot of things that, that are real positives. We just want to make sure that the cybersecurity angle is also considered in there so that we can take full advantage of these new features and new technologies that are, you know, rapidly evolving and, and uh, being distributed into, you know, product models. And Absolutely. So. And with that in mind, what are some of the projects, the research and development projects that S&T is funding that are sure. looking at some of those solutions? Well, one of them, and, and we were just talking about, uh, uh, or mentioned kind of patch and, and, and management, just like, uh, or updating, just like with your, your phone, yeah. um, you know, whatever model you have, you're updating your phone on a regular basis, uh, your, your laptop, your PC, whatever software in there. So cars are no different, right? So in the past, we'd have to go into the garage mm. um, or into your dealership or to a mechanic and, you know, they'd hook up. I mean, I used to, you know, I had a, I had a, I won't say which model, but I had a, you know, in my college army days, I had a, you know, car that I could actually physically work on. Right. I'd go in and change the spark plugs. I'd monkey around with it, right? Not that I'm any big auto mechanic kind of guy, but I could just, nowadays it's, you know, there's too many computer modules, there's things in there, sure you can work on it mm -hmm. and do some basic things, but you're bringing it into the mechanic and, and hooking it up to a machine and they're flashing things into those ECU ports or they're, you know, plugging things in for diagnostics or to update, kind of like the, the firmware, or the BIOS on, on your computer type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, that's still going to be an effect, we think, you know, in, in our ecosystem, so, so to speak. But as Brendan said, there's, you know, these cars are now connected, right? You know, whether or not it's Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, LTE, whatever your mode, there, there is now connectivity over the air. Mm -hmm. So you may not have to go into the mechanic physically and have a mechanic physically 
connect to your car to do an update, right? So software over the air is going to be, you know, more and more prevalent. Uh, and in that case, we want to make sure that those updates are legitimate, yeah. that they're safe. There's, you know, the, the same, some of the same uh, threats and risks that we see in, in other uh, use cases with phones and, and, and laptops and whatnot, you know, man in the middle attacks, other, other things that, yeah. that can, you know, get malicious code into there that you think is legitimate, you know, phishing attacks and all sorts of things. Click on that link. Oh, man. So we have one uh, really interesting and, and really rapidly progressing uh, project uh, combination uh, collaborative efforts with uh, NYU uh, UMTREE, which is the University of, of uh, Michigan uh, Research Transpor Transportation Research Institute, and also the Southwest uh, Transportation Research Institute, um, working on making sure that when you're getting that update from whether or not it's a tier one supplier or the OEM, the automotive, you know, you, you, wherever you bought your car from yeah. that makes your car, that that secure update is legitimate right. as much as we can, can, that it's encrypted properly, that it's a framework uh, called Uptane uh, that's based upon the, the trusted update framework out of Tor and whatnot. So just applied very specifically into um, the automotive space and, and ECUs and, and all those modules. Yeah. Um, so we have a few others that, that uh, you guys want to kind of go over? Yeah. Sure, yes. So uh, another uh, aspect of the research we're doing is into this uh, realm of open source automotive research tools, hmm. which are, so open source refers to tools where the source code or the schematics for, in the case of hardware, they're all available, it's, it's freely online, and trying to make these tools more accessible to people who are interested in doing this research, yeah. because for a long time, one of the big barriers to getting into and you know, monitoring and seeing how these giant computers on wheels work was that the tools to do it were really expensive and the ways to interact with your car were very expensive. So there's a great hobbyist community out there of people who are involved in monitoring their cars and trying to see how they work. So uh, a few years ago, or last year in October, uh, so about just about a year ago, we had an uh, open source workshop at the Volby Center. We brought together all these people building these different tools all of them were open source. We were trying to connect them with other industry stakeholders and to figure out how we can work together in order to advance this automotive research challenge. And another example is a project by HRL Laboratories in mm -hmm. California uh, on side channels to detect to detect faults. Mm -hmm. And you know, these are cyber physical systems. So they combine the cyber and physical worlds. Right. And so this is looking at physical characteristics to help substantiate what's going on on the cyber side. So side channels are commonly used by attackers to reveal secret keys. So they'll look mm -hmm. at things like RF emissions, acoustic emissions, or power fluctuations, and they can actually apply signal processing and figure out what your cryptographic key is, just, just oh from these very minor signals in, in whatever it is they're monitoring. So HRL Laboratories is exploring the use of electromagnetic emanations to monitor power usage of these embedded processors, mm. or ECUs, uh, in automobiles. Uh, so they apply signal processing uh, to this uh, in order to be able to understand and learn the different processor states. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they can use this information to detect a s system compromise. So j just as an example, uh, by monitoring the transmission ECU, uh, one can actually determine what gear the car is in. And then if you compare that with the information on the, uh, the automotive bus, the automotive network, it's yeah. called the CAN bus, uh, then you can correlate that and make sure that the car is actually in the same uh, cyber state as the corresponding uh, physical state. Uh, and it's also difficult for an attacker to uh, alter the functionality of the car uh, without also altering this observable uh, side channel behavior. Interesting. Yeah. Wow. So there's a lot of avenues and there's a lot to think about when it comes to securing these systems, these networks, because it sounds like there's a lot of different, uh, different ways they can get in. Yeah, it, it's things like the side channel that you really, you know, don't think about, but yeah. then you just think about, well, if I can detect the, the electromagnetic, you know, or the, or the RF frequencies off of that and do that with off-the-shelf, uh, you know, tools and whatnot. Mm. It's, it's an interesting thing, but using it from a defensive standpoint, right? That's really is the more in, is the innovation of yeah. saying, hey, can we detect, you know, cost-effectively, you know, a, a you know regular state with something that's changed, and at least raise that kind of logic into mm. the cybersecurity realm and say, hey, this may not be appropriate. Let's let's pause or, or let's take a different avenue or, or something like that. There's some interesting uh, approaches there. So. Very cool. What are some of the ways that um, S&T and the DOT Volpe Center are partnering together on this? 
Well, from DHS perspective, I mean, DHS obviously we're national security, homeland security, uh, and we're you know in this space in this area because uh, you know we our fleet managers, our, our mission components, what we call our, our sub agencies within the department. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, are very uh, law enforcement, you know, uh, sensitive, very law enforcement uh, heavy to an extent, but we buy the same vehicles as you and I, you know, drive. So, yeah. and we're not experts, we're experts in cybersecurity in other areas, obviously. So partnering with, with DOT Volpe, uh, as well as leveraging SRI and others uh, to bring in that, you know, deep wealth of knowledge um, and capabilities that they have in, inherently is has been a great great partnership and feedback our you know our needs and mission concerns into the automotive community and help you know broaden that out as well is is where we're focused. So it's been a great partnership. Yeah. So the division that I'm in focuses on advanced vehicle technology. So this is a, an area that we've been familiar with for a very long time, mostly looking at uh, electronics. Um, reliability research okay. was uh, was the long history and then recently got more involved in cybersecurity after um, the the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration had approached us and said you know this looks like a, a very interesting concern you know what how valid is this concern yeah. turns out that they were on to something very valid. <laughs> and uh, yeah. and it became it, as we started to think more about the problem we were we tried to think of a way Volpe has a very broad reach and a lot of very multimodal approach to things we work on variety of vehicles both on the ground in the sky and, and and everywhere in between and we wanted to apply our our expertise in understanding kind of the technical bits of these machines and apply that to something more programmatic and to kind of assist the, the department of homeland security as best we could so to that end we focused a lot on securing government fleets and looking at specific vulnerabilities in government fleets mm. th that center mostly around uh, fleet management systems. Okay. And these are generally aftermarket devices which get connected into vehicles and they monitor the health and safety of the vehicle, they help do predictive maintenance, they help to make sure that there's no waste, fraud, and abuse going on, mm -hmm. that people aren't taking vehicles where they shouldn't be. And uh, we came up with a primer for fleet managers to help them start to think about their fleet of cars as more like a fleet of computers. Okay. And we're additionally helping the General Services Administration, who does all, all of the purchasing for, oh, yeah. for the government to help them to build in procurement language when they're, right, when they're trying to <coughs> buy these systems to make sure that these systems are, um, are secure. Mm -hmm. And one, one thing to mention, again, for, for the audience here is, well, when we talk about fleet management, telematics, I mean, that's, you know, UPS, FedEx, our fleets, yeah. and, you know, our, our fleet of vehicles, right? Um, that, that is a more robust version that we're seeing in, I think, in a, a, a you know, commercial space or a, you know, individual citizen mm. space where, you know, you're seeing insurance companies and others that are issuing out dongles and other things to plug in for, you know, monitor, you know, how you're driving, oh, safety. Yeah. So, again, much smaller version, but that's on a, on a spectrum, wouldn't you say, you know, Brendan? Oh, absolutely, so. yeah. So things that we're discovering, learning, um, helping to adjust into this ecosystem mm -hmm. will trickle out into a broader, you know, re regular citizen. I'm driving a car and I'm, I'm you know, concerned about these things. So. Absolutely. So, Brendan, ought to say a little bit about the uh, lab they have and some of the technical assessments that they conduct. Sure. So, uh, we currently have a lab in, uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, is where the Volpe Center is located. And we do have a couple late uh, model year vehicles, which we actually received through a partnership with the Canadian government. So, this is actually like oh, a, cool. an international collaboration. Mm -hmm. And some of the assessments we've done on those vehicles have uh, been looking at these mitigation tools that mm -hmm. I talked about a little bit earlier mm -hmm. um, and making sure that they work as they're intended. Um, obviously more research to do there, looking at adverse effects of, of connecting them. Um, and more recently we've been looking at and partnering with Carnegie Mellon University um, down in Pittsburgh to look at these actual devices and to test and validate their security and to make sure that there aren't any back doors or unintended functionality that can be taken advantage of to manipulate the vehicle in a way that mm -hmm. is not safe for the driver or operator. Wow. Yeah. 
So we're talking about government fleet. I want to talk about some of the unique challenges that that presents in terms of you know protecting from cyber attack. What are some of the threats, if you can get into it, that is you know unique to the government fleet, or what are, what sort of things are we looking at from a, from a government fleet perspective? Well, as I mentioned, you know, especially for DHS uh, and other you know law enforcement um, and national security, you know, cyber or cyber security, national security, homeland security, law enforcement focus. You know, we have. You know your regular vehicles that may have you know the police lights mm -hmm. you know on them when very obvious that that they're a uh, law enforcement vehicle but we also have you know undercover uh, vehicles um you know diplomatic you know fleet type of vehicles yep. with uh, department of state um and other things that may be you know slightly modified but like we were discussing earlier they're the same cars they may you know be somewhat modified because they're law enforcement they may have a a little bit bigger engine or something, but they're not dramatically different yeah. than than the car that that you know you and I are driving. Um, so some of the concerns on there are obviously you know there's there's a lot of advantages for GPS tracking mm. and monitoring, right? Um, so making sure that that is secure so that bad guys can't tell exactly where, where that yeah. you know Secret Service vehicle is, um, or that Coast Guard vehicle, or that that other law enforcement vehicle. Um, you know so. And we've already talked a little bit about it. We'd all be concerned about any kind of, you know, interruption of, of the vehicle, deploying, you know, you're, you're driving along and all of a sudden your car is trying to self-park. Yeah. You know, type of, I mean, there's things that, again, I'm exaggerating a bit, but, but um, those are some of the same concerns that I think anybody would have, but probably a little bit uh, different for, for a law enforcement uh, sensitive mm -hmm. as, aspect. So. Um, probably we won't get into, I, I won't get any specifics in, but sure. but maybe Brenda can cover some, some generalities as well, because we all deal in the same uh, areas. Sure. So I, I would say one issue that comes to mind is that government vehicles, as you were mentioning, they, they tend to be similar across, you know, across the spectrum. So mm. you have a wide variety of, or not a wide variety, a small variety of vehicles, but you have a lot of them. So oh. that means that in the event that a... Um, as an exploit was crafted that could affect these vehicles, it could potentially affect a large number of them. Not just so, one or two. Not that just is. one or two. So, so we really get concerned about that fleet effect and, and the impacts that it could have not only on our first responder community, but also kind of like the U.S. economy as a whole. Yeah. Well, and that's something I should have mentioned, not just law enforcement, but, you know, while not specific to DHS, but in, you know, there's first responders are, are important, you know, very important part of our community, right? So firefighter, yeah. you know, fire trucks, uh, EMT vehicles, ambulances, you know, those those things as well. So, the state and local Yeah, levels. state and local governments as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Point. Um, and linking that again towards, you mentioned, you know, there's industry that have, you know, the same concerns and are going to be interested in this kind of technology. Um, I wonder, how is the government collaborating with automobile manufacturers on some of these items or some of these issues? Yeah, that's, that's excellent. I mean, maybe Dave can, can feel this a little bit. We, uh... Yeah, it's interesting. We've uh, worked collaboratively with DHS and uh, Volpe to create uh, an automotive cybersecurity industry consortium, hmm. or AKIC uh, is what we call it. Love, so a, this... love our acronyms. <laughs> yeah. This is a voluntary technology-oriented public-private partnership. So mm -hmm. you've got government working with, you know, private industry. Uh, it's a collaboration between DHS, S&T, Volpe, uh, along with support from SRI International. And the basic idea is we work with a number of major OEMs, or original equipment manufacturers. Okay. And the OEMs pool their funding and leverage it with government funding. So uh, each puts in a little bit, and then uh, you multiply that by a factor of, say, 10, and next thing you know, you've got a nice pool that you can leverage in order to conduct uh, research. So the consortium identifies, prioritizes, and conducts what, what we call pre-competitive uh, research mm. projects that address critical cybersecurity challenges in automobiles. So the projects, you know, are identified by the group, and they provide mutual benefit across uh, all of the members and for the nation uh, mm. in helping to address the cybersecurity risk uh, in automobiles. Uh, in fact, uh, we're just about to initiate our very first project, which is going to be in the area of tools and testing. And we're also uh, starting to put together a second project that will be looking at uh, uh, sort of doing a threat assessment uh, for vehicles. Yeah. Wow. Well, and in, important to tag onto that as well is that that's also an indication that the automobile manufacturers, the, the ones that are, they're taking, you know, cybersecurity very seriously. Uh, mm -hmm. They are addressing it. They are, you know, they, they are not, um, you know, 
they're not ignoring the, the risk of it at all. Yeah. Uh, so they're being very proactive and whatnot. And, it, and it's always great to, to see that kind of collaborative. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, from a, from a governmental perspective and DHS, you know, DOT Volpe and, and others, you know, we're there to help catalyze and fill those, those gaps um, and, and to put things together that isn't already being addressed mm -hmm. by the private sector and others, and also kind of take advantage of, of each other. So that kind of dialogue with, with the group and the automobile manufacturers have been you know, great and been key. We, we have a similar um, consortium in the oil and gas industry and aviation and financial. So mm, right. that, is, that is key that you, know, you don't hear a lot about, but it's, it's key to have that collaborative uh, community and, and partnerships with uh, the OEMs in this space. So. Yeah. You know, what else occurs to me? Uh, you mentioned the Uptane project mm -hmm. earlier, right? The secure software over the air updates. Uh, and that project uh, with NYU, Umtree, and Swiri has also engaged uh, yeah. uh, the OEMs and uh, a lot of the suppliers. And okay. so they've held a regular series of working group meetings mm -hmm. where uh, industry comes in and helps identify requirements uh, and provides guidance in terms of putting together the specifications that then become available for them to incorporate into uh, their, their products. Wow. Yeah. So it's a real force multiplier. You know, everyone's got shared interests in here, so why not pool resources and make sure that everyone's getting the benefit of this research? Well, especially in these areas, I mean, you know, so DHS, I mean, we're very much into the applied R&D mm. you know, space. So we partner with uh, National Science Foundation, you know, the NSF, NIST, and others for more longer reaching and foundational research, mm. but we're in the applied space. So the, the work that our projects that we're collaborating with or funding and working with great performers, and, and you, we've mentioned a few of them, getting that out of laboratory into commercialization transition to practice is what we're all about so yeah. having that uh, key with the industry is is you know that that helps bridge that that transom that, that yeah. valley to get uh, great technologies out of the our labs and into into everybody's hands right we always say engage your customers early and often yes. throughout the entire life cycle yeah, throughout it so <laughs> well speaking of engaging we want to uh, answer a couple of questions from facebook our first one is, how can graduate students in engineering, either electrical or mechanical, et cetera, use their core skills in cybersecurity? Are there any specific applications? Well, I'll take the, the general, because I'm the generalist in the, mm. in the room to, to an extent. Um, one thing I found uh, in the cyber-physical systems, uh, cyber-physical security space uh, writ large, uh, mainly from the infrastructure standpoint, right? Mm. You know, uh, 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 power plant, water plant, chemical plant, you know, whatever it may be. Uh, we've had 100 years of engineering, you know, uh, operational technology with, you know, information technology. So operational technology is your, you, you may have heard, you know, SCADA controls and, uh, you know, other things, yeah. right? Industrial control systems that have been in place. We didn't think they'd be or still in place this long, 75, you know, years later, but they are. Um, <laughs> But uh, I, I think from an engineering standpoint, the disciplines are, are really kind of to blur and cross, right? So mm -hmm. even though we're, we're architecting and systems engineering, uh, the cybersecurity aspects or, or just cyber, you know, um, um, information technology mm -hmm. aspects into these systems, you know, what is that physical safe mode? Right. What yeah. happens if something happens here? Is there a manual valve that you can turn? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, is there something that in a car that you still have? It's it's mostly fly by wire to an extent. But what are those kind of safety uh, design features that engineers? I think you know whether or not it's electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, just you know uh, all aspects of the, of the engineering spectrum, tied in with with. Uh, you know, systems engineering on, on a software, mm. you know, basis tied in with hardware. Yeah. I, I think that's how you, you know, you, you apply that. I think an interdisciplinary team when you're designing a product or an outcome or feature is is kind of key. And that's why we keep hitting on kind of that, that security by design. It's, it's, it's safety engineering. Yeah. By design and all those things into it. Now, now I'll, I'll defer to the to the to the real experts on, on those. I mean, I think I probably have like a shorter, maybe more practical question. And I would say, um, start like think like a hacker. Take stuff mm -hmm. apart, yeah. break it, unbreak yeah, it. Tinker, you know, yeah. tinker with it, see how it works, and then try to make it malfunction. Yeah. And then Ad it, and then think thinking. about yeah. yeah. And then if you can make it malfunction, think about how you could design it differently so that it wouldn't malfunction. And uh, that can be a good way to just put yourself in the mind space of 
instead of building something to work well, build something to work securely. Yeah, we, we talk graceful degradation and other things um, as I said, safe mode. But yeah, that's what happens when it doesn't work perfectly, does it? Yeah. You, do you have that graceful degradation of capability or a safe mode that you can glide into you know, the parking lot it's or whatever it may be? Yeah. We're also finding that more and more universities are starting to offer uh, introductory cybersecurity courses, if not entire mm. uh, programs yeah. uh, in the area. So I would strongly encourage any engineering students that are out there to take advantage yeah. of any courses that might be offered at your university. Yeah. Uh, even if you're not planning to go into cybersecurity per se, uh, as these guys were alluding to, it's an important skill to know and understand and should become a pervasive part of everything uh, that we design and engineer. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, next question, do any of you have any background on legislation regarding cybersecurity, either in the U.S. or international, like EU or, or China? Well, since we're techie, geeky, kind of, kind of, <laughs> or, you know, at least I hope I'm kind of geeky, geeky, I think geeky's cool. Um, yeah, there, there's all sorts of legislation mm -hmm. out, you know, out there that's, that's uh, you know, currently floating around or, or whatnot. So really probably, you know, from a policy perspective, that's, that's something that, you know, monitor the websites, monitor kind of the news and, and see the interactions and, and what's kind of driving those and, and you know, get out there and vote, talk to your company, you know, all that yeah. kind of stuff, research. And there's so many different aspects of that. So there, there's a few out there that are, that are uh, pending or in motion around. And, and I've been along, uh, you know, fed for a while. It's, you see various flavor, flavors of, of that uh, off and on. So, you know, more awareness of cybersecurity aspects into all aspects of our life yeah. are, is positive. So. Well, being the techies that we are, one of the cool things about working with DHS s and and with DOT Volpe is that uh, you know, they're not regulatory mm -hmm. and they're not about policy and law. It's all technical. So yeah. We, yeah. we just get the focus on the cool technical stuff yeah. and, and let the, the politicians and the lawyers and the yeah. lobbyists and all the others deal with, with the policy. Yeah. They do their thing. We yeah. get to dive in and that's, look at all the cool stuff. That's the nice part. You know, we're not the regulatory. We're, we're just, right. you know, right. we're more of a feeder into one of our concerns. And, and that's critical. In particular with the AKIC, the yeah. consortium mm -hmm. I mentioned yeah. uh, earlier, uh, because it is about the technology, and yeah. we get to come to the table and sit down with the OEMs, yeah. and they don't have to fear working or interacting with us. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. Next question. Have you seen indications that adversaries are specifically interested in exploiting cyber vulnerabilities in vehicles, not necessarily focusing on government or law enforcement, just vehicles in general? Well, uh, and I'll keep this very, very general, and not the super secret squirrel, I'm not in that, you know, in that world or anything. But uh, no, I think you can, you know, extrapolate and, and think some logical things of, you know, if they're, you know, individual vehicles, probably, you know, not not all that that much, right? Mm -hmm. um, but when you're talking about, um, you know, we we talked a little bit about fleet level yeah. type of thing. So if there's an exploit or something that you can affect tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of cars that are on the you know, road that then clog up the road, take up, you know, resources during a hurricane or whatnot. I mean, yeah. so there's some things there that, that you know, would be concerning. Um, but um, that, that those are some things why we're looking at, at those kind of uh, generalities and, you know, uh, from fleet management and, and other things in there. So, mm. yeah. I think, go I ahead. Mean, I, I would say that the you know, if you look at some of the security research that's gone on in the hobbyist community, mm -hmm. that there are, there's th absolutely every indication that, you know, when, when you see things like Car Hacking Village at most of the major security conferences that are yeah. happening this yeah. year, I mean, there's definitely a degree of interest and I think that people, you know, yeah. people are capable of this if, if they want to. I think one of the issues is uh, always the, the economic model behind it. And, and I think that right. mm. as soon as there's a way to monetize some of these exploits, that's when we're going to start to see yeah. um, a big uptick. In, Just like with ransomware and other areas. Exactly. Uh, yeah. yeah. I was going to mention, up to this point, fortunately, most of the attacks that we've seen have just been research and hacking right. villages. Yeah, it, it's and been research. we haven't research. seen and, and, anything and it's excellent too. It, live. But one of the things that at least I personally uh, fear is if we were to see an uptick in something like ransomware, mm. which can start to impact. Uh, and you know, in, in that case, you just you've got to be real careful about. Just like with your, you know, your home computer, your laptop, your phone, you've just got to be real careful about uh, how you work with your car and uh, you know what you introduce to it and uh, good best practices always go a long way. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Very true. Uh, next question. What are top priority threats and threat models OEMs and government are considering in vehicle cybersecurity? Well, I think we just touched upon that, that, that yeah. a little bit. Um, 
you know, but we're, we're looking, you know, just like anything in cybersecurity, right, it's an attack surface. Yeah. Um, it's attack vectors and whatnot. So, for example, not that this is any bigger concern than any others, but we're also in conjunction with DOT, Volpe, and SRI, and Department of Energy, we're also looking into, you know, electronic vehicles. They're all electronic. Uh, <laughs> electrical vehicles, uh, because again, that's you're plugging your hybrid car or whatnot into, you know, is that just like a power cord or yeah. USB cord or a, you know, or an Ethernet you know wire or whatnot? So, again, nothing that's you know more concerning than other things in there. But looking at that type of attack surface, um, and again, I think we talked about a little bit. Again, what's the motivation? Is it is it a nation state adversary? Is it a you know, monetary kind of what's right. what's the motivation mm. and why you know and when uh, so I think those kind of exploits exactly. you know the car versus your phone versus your computer yeah. um, versus your refrigerator at home and HVAC system I mean it's all becoming interconnected yeah and it depends on what the motivation is in there but the, they're all computers it's just a is it on wheels it is in your house is it in your phone right so Sure. Appropriately spooky for Correct, correct me if I build upon what I've what I've said. <laughs> yeah, I'm. It, they're all. Um, I forgot ex exactly what the question was, but yeah, it, in terms of, of threat and threat factors, it's it's the fleet level stuff. I, we're not trying to uh, not trying to scare anyone and say your car is going to get hacked tomorrow, and you know you got to be careful. Pl rip all the electronics out of it. It's yeah. it's that we, we're aware of these kind of structural issues, and we're trying to fix them before it reaches a, an issue. Yeah. Well, and, and I think we've you know, talked a little bit about it, but you know, just like any market forces, right, as, as a consumer, <laughs> just like folks are starting to ask about their smart thermostat, yeah. or smart, you know, you folks hopefully writ large you know, will start asking those questions to the manufacturers, and we've already seen the OEMs get ahead of this that right. says, hey, my car is now, I got you know Wi-Fi and hotspot and, everything, and it's self-parking and uh, lane controls and DB you know, all this stuff mm -hmm. and, and uh, you know they should be asking those questions of hey you know should I be you know how are we securing this and whatnot again not from a fear or that you know that should be a right. sort of, but a, but just a general market force that says hey we we want to make sure that these things are you know safe and secure just Absolutely. like just like anything else we use. Mm -hmm. Another question: Which vehicles are you seeing as the most hacked system? Well, yeah, I think we talked about it a little bit. I mean, there's, there's, you know, we're talking generalities now. We're, you know, we're, we're looking at this potential and those risks, uh, not seeing a across all, across all the, you, know, you know, models. And, and as David mentioned about the AKIC and the consortium with mm -hmm. OEMs, it's, it, you know, while, while we're not putting out the names of those those manufacturers, it's a, you know, good, good major OEMs from U.S. and international mm -hmm. based companies. Uh, that are looking into this and are taking uh, pr very proactive exactly. uh, action to make sure that their vehicles are and, and the fleet mo or the fleet the models you know now and, the, and especially the models coming out in 2020 and beyond um, are as secure as can be right you know you can't make everything you know nothing is 100 percent but they're very proactive on yeah. it. so no, no yeah. specific one that we're concerned about or seeing more because it's you know it's what's in the real world and in the wild versus what we're seeing in potential in labs and whatnot. Yeah, now. I mean, I was going to say that the most hacked vehicle that I see is the one that's in my lab. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Well, you know. thank God it's in your yeah. lab. Yeah, so yeah. Keep it in Don't the hack lab. your ride. Yeah, no. <laughs> hack someone else's ride. <laughs> that's right. Hack a research vehicle. Um, so, Good advice. Yeah. Um, <laughs> any more? Any no, no, that's it. Just bring, gotcha. bring some humor in it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, well, sort of to wrap things up, are there any final comments, any other advice you'd offer to folks um, just about vehicle cybersecurity in general? Any, anything you want to leave us with today? Well, I, I, again, I think it's, you know, remember, you know, nowadays it's not just, uh, you know, spark plugs and, and a Cadillac converter and, and uh, you know, um, and the mechanical aspects of yeah. the car. They, they are multiple computers, and those computers come from multiple different suppliers that are very well interconnected, mm -hmm. um, so we just got to be, you know, be uh, safe and secure, and just you know think about those things. But also, I think my last, you know, would, you know, don't be fearful of your car. Go go buy a modern car. Don't don't buy the <laughs> you know the the thirty year old car right. Right, unless you're you know you're, you're really into into you know older cars. But because uh, the technology that is also simultaneously being deployed into our vehicles today, you know. Increase safety, increases safety, increases efficiency, reduces liability, a lot of great aspects. And then, you know, the future is bright type of thing. We just want to be, you know, safe and secure future. So. 
Yeah, exa- I mean, I'd say I'm more interest. I'm interested in a lot of the the new safety features that are that are coming out. That mm-hmm. are kind of this bridge towards autonomous vehicles is something we think a lot about it at DOT. So I'm I'm excited for that. But I think before we can fully realize that, we got to make sure that what we have is is secure. So the next generation of secure architectures, I'd say, is something I'm interested in. And the other thing I would mention is the work on uh, the Cyber Physical System Security Program isn't just limited to uh, vehicles. So uh, we're also looking at things like uh, medical devices, Mm. building controls, Mm -hmm. uh, the energy grid, energy systems, uh, and uh, you've also got a program in uh, uh, Internet of Things or IoT devices. Mm. So that's the thing. It's it's across the board. A lot. It's all happening. And uh, the cross pollinate. I mean, one thing that you know, one last thing that I think we all, in our respective organizations and collectively together, um, aspects that we're doing in the automotive and vehicle cybersecurity, can you know, are and can cross pollinate into other areas. Whether or not it's medical devices, hospitals, um, building control systems in a smart building, and whatnot. A lot of the you know, and vice versa. So things that we're learning um, and have projects in other areas in IoT. Uh, Internet of Things, right? Um, you know, the car is becoming an IoT, and more things, your IoT wearables and whatnot will interact with your car. So, uh, the cybersecurity efforts that that community and the projects we have going on there are also really interesting and in, in plugging into. So, good point, Dave. Awesome. Yeah. I'm excited to hear more about those programs moving forward. Yeah. Thank you all so much for being sure, here today. Sure, sure. Uh, we hope pleasure. you enjoyed the tech talk. If you have any additional questions, we invite you to check out our website or shoot us an email. Uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you.